Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to New Books in the American West, a channel on the New Books Network of podcasts. I'm your host for today's interview, Stephen Hausman. I'm an assistant professor of history at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota, and today I'm very excited to be speaking with Dr. Alyssa Ford, an associate professor of history at Northwest Missouri State University. We're going to be discussing her latest book, Rodeo as Refuge, Rodeo as Rebellion, Gender, Race, and Identity in the American Rodeo, which came out last year in 2020 with the University Press of Kansas. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Alyssa. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. Um, To begin, we always like on New Books Network to to first just let the authors uh, tell a little bit about themselves. So can you just give us a bit about your background and how you became interested in history and how you became interested in the history of rodeo specifically? So little do you know, you actually ask a question that has a very winding answer um, in many ways. So uh, I'm from Texas. I'm from a small town in rural Texas. Uh, where there were people around me who did rodeo, but to my knowledge, there was never a rodeo in my hometown, and I did not participate in rodeo. Um, I think I only went to one rodeo when I was growing up. Um, And so let let me maybe first, even though I started with my rodeo stuff, I'll start with how I became interested in history, and then we'll transition that into rodeo. They all all combine, actually. Um, So I went in college. I did not do history. Um, I was an international studies major with a double minor in African studies and music, and I focused on international developments in dryland, sub-Saharan Africa. I got super specific really early. Um, And my senior year, I realized that in order to do that work, which I I really loved, but I would would probably need to live in New York City, um, D.C. or Africa, and I I wasn't feeling like those were places that I really wanted um, to live and to make my career and my life. Um, and so as, as most people do when they're seniors in college, are thinking, oh, my God, like, what do I what do I what am I going to do for a job? And I'm kind of thinking, oh, my God, what do I do now? I'm kind of changing my focus. Um, and so I was thinking about what I loved to do. And I always loved history. I loved to read history books. I have so many books on my bookshelf at school right now that are these academic and kind of biographical books about women in the West in like the 1800s and early 1900s. Um, and I also always loved museums. And so I decided to do an internship my last year in college at the National Cowgirl Museum and Hall of Fame in Fort Worth, Texas, which is about an hour and a half from my hometown. And so at that museum, it really is where all of this came together um, because it made me realize that I did really want to do history and specifically history of the American West and women in the American West for graduate school. I was really interested in doing kind of public history or museum studies programs. Um, because that's that was kind of my goal um, to do when I went into grad school was to work in a museum, and and I was it really sparked my interest in rodeo as what I wanted to study. Um, when I was at the Cowgirl Museum, and this internship was in January of 2003, um, part of what I did was I was looking through, going through all of the um, nominations that were coming in for the Hall of Fame. And as I was looking at those, um, I was also then looking at them in comparison to the the women who were already a part of the Hall of Fame. Um, And at that time, there were only um, two non-white women in in the Hall of Fame, um, a mother and daughter um, who uh, were African-American and lived in Houston. And this, as someone from Texas and someone who had some some kind of awareness of rodeo, though not something I had participated in specifically, This surprised me because I knew that there was this long history of Hispanic ranches in Texas. Um, I knew that there, based on the popularity of rodeo in Texas and the American South, there had to be more of an African-American involvement in rodeo. I think at that time, I did know that there was a Native American rodeo circuit, but I didn't really know much more about it than that. Um, And so I just started to want to know more about the about the fact that there had to be these rodeos and there had to be women who were participating in them, but I wasn't really seeing them um, represented at that time at the museum. And as a note, at the, the museum has many more, um, much more diversity in its representation today. Um, it's just when people were starting to look into that those areas a little bit more. Um, and so 
when I decided uh, when the following well a year after that when I started my master's program at Arizona State um, I decided that this is what I, I wanted to do I wanted to look for um, these other groups of women who were involved in rodeo I so that was 2006 finishing my master's continued that into my PhD uh, which I finished in 2009 2010 and then so I've, this is a project I've been working on for a very very long uh, long time um, that has finally come out uh, with the book. Very much, it seems like a labor of of love and and of curiosity. And I found in reading it that that your curiosity and interest in the subject really really came off the page. I mean, I'm I'm someone that you know I'm from I'm from the the very much not 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 the west. I'm from the the, the northeast, from Rochester, New York originally. And uh, I don't know much about rodeo, and uh, I found myself wanting to know more. And you do a good job of of guiding a a, a neophyte like myself through through the the story of rodeo. Thank thank you so much. That's something I really did want to do with this is have it be a book that sort of straddled um, like an academic piece, but also a piece that just someone who was involved in rodeo and didn't want all of this kind of academic jargon and theory thrown at them, that they would also find interesting. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a lot of really fun pictures in it and these interesting personal stories and also these stories about these different circuits that are developing. Um, And so I, I was hoping that it would be open and engaging for a kind of a, a popular audience, a book that like my parents would want to read. It is it is definitely that and refreshingly jargon free. And you know, our readers at home might not be able to see see the cover, but it's worth it's worth uh, looking up on the internet because it has a really great cover of uh, an African American rodeo writer who is sort of looking jubilant on the front. And it's it's a really great, great book cover. So um I'm interested in how you framed the book. The the title is Rodeo as Refuge, Rodeo as Rebellion, which is it's a it's a evocative title. And I'm wondering, um, kind of on the one hand, why did you decide to write a book about rodeo as a space for refuge and rebellion specifically? And why why this kind of framing? How can rodeo be a space for refuge and rebellion? Yeah, so this is a title that I have actually had for a really long time. I can't I found, I was just going through a, doc, I had, you know, as we all do, I had a, a Word document where I was like, oh, pop, possible titles, right? Or possible books I want to do in the future. And I found Rodeo as Refuge, Rodeo as Rebellion in there. And it was at, it may have even been during my, like my master's degree that I was doing this. So, I mean, it's a title that has stuck with me for a long time, but I don't think that I fully figured out like the meaning of that until I was really more involved in the book process. Um, it just signed, kind of sounded like a cool title. I think the alliteration of it sort of drew, drew, that, drew me to it. Um, but it's a, it's a title that I very firmly stand by. Um, so in the book, I talk about rodeo as being a site of cultural history where the past is performed and reproduced and invented. Um, and there's something about rodeo that is, it is so interesting. And, and actually, I had pushed pretty hard for this inter- interview to be on the, uh, the sport network as opposed to the American West um, one, because I, I really would like people in this country to see rodeo as a sport. And it is so almost always tied to this thing of the American West. Um, and it and, and it is a sport as well. Um, but it is also something that you can't really separate from the American West. Um, rodeo has this kind of historical legitimacy to it um, because it came from this working background it, and it evolved out of that. And th- there's something about that past experience that so many different groups in the United States have um, that that kind of legitimacy, that authenticity of rodeo where it like it is a sport, but it's something that is more than a sport, right? It has, and I know people love football, and I know people love baseball, and it means very, very much to them. But the rodeo is something different that it's like people are kind of connecting to it as with like a part of their soul, right? Like this is a this is a part of them, and it has this meaning beyond just the competitive nature to it. Um. And, and this is, of course, kind of interesting because I know I just made a statement where I said rodeo is performed, reproduced, and invented. Um, so it still has this kind of authenticity to it, even when it is continually being remade and performed. Um, and what I really argue in the book is that it is this kind of historical background of rodeo 
that allows these separate race and group specific rodeos to continue long after separate rodeos were required by law or kind of forced to exist separately because of discrimination and racism and homophobia. Um, and by continuing, these rodeos become a way to convey cultural memory and it allows groups to the participants in these groups to make um, claims to both their group history and to a broader American history. Um, and so what I found is that for some groups and for some people, these separate rodeos are a refuge, right? Like they are a safe place to exist as a community and it is a safe place to participate in the rodeo. Um, I mean, we can see this throughout history for Native Americans in rodeo, for Black rodeo, for gay rodeo. I mean, it was you were not allowed to participate in kind of mainstream Western white heterosexual rodeo, um, or it was not safe for you to do so. So these separate rodeos became, by definition, a refuge, a place that was safe for you and a place that you could celebrate um, kind of that existence and the rodeo itself. Um, but simultaneously, these separate rodeos are also a site of rebellion because these are people staking a claim, not just to an American identity. And as a note, it is pretty rebellious to stake a claim to an American identity or to a Western identity if you are not included in that in that identity. Right. Um, so if you are gay and for you to say, like, no, I am part of the American West and my story is a part of the American West, like that is shifting our understanding of what it means to be a, a Westerner, right? I mean, that's rebellious on its own. But beyond staking that claim to an American identity, they are also pretty loudly proclaiming their own identity and they are celebrating that difference. Um, and we can see this so clearly in every single one of these rodeos um, that, that I look at and that I talk about in this book. There, and, and that's the reason I think that's another one of the reasons why these separate rodeos have still existed the, when so many other like separate kind of sporting leagues based on race um, no longer exist um, because there's something different about rodeo because of its historical ties and because of the way in which people are making a claim about their identity, their past as a group and as Americans. And we will definitely make sure that uh, this interview gets cross-listed on our sports studies channel because uh, I, I think you make a very firm and, and convincing case that, that yes, the rodeo has to be understood on the terms that you just described. Can you tell us a bit about the history of rodeo uh, for, for folks who might be uh, listening to the podcast and not as familiar with its history? Uh, so what, what is the history of, of rodeo as a sport, both as uh, an amateur sport and as a professional sport? How far back can we trace its roots? Um, so in the United States, um, the first kind of noted rodeo, and as a, as a note, there's a lot of competition about um, we have the first rodeo. No, we have the oldest rodeo. No, we have the oldest rodeo. There's a lot of different places that try to like make that claim. Um, but the first kind of noted advertised rodeos as rodeos um, really kind of appear in the 1880s and 1890s in the U.S. Um, and there were some of the really large competitions, sort of like national competitions, like the Cheyenne Frontier Days, um, in Wyoming, um, was established in 1897, and then the Pendleton Roundup in 1910. Um, but of course, there were these like kind of informal, um, sort of like ranch rodeos today, where people on who worked on ranches are getting together and they're having roundups and like who can like rope the most uh, cows the fastest and like oh, so that's where rodeo comes from, and that type of informal competition existed well before we have the like formalized rodeos that are being advertised as these rodeo competitions in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, by the time we get the formation of like Cheyenne and Pendleton um, in the late 1890s and 1910s, it's really leading us into what we can kind of call like the golden age of rodeo. Um, and I'd say especially the golden age for women um, in rodeo was like in the 1910s and 1920s where women could um, compete almost equally with men. They could compete in pretty much all of the same events, including rough stock events like steer wrestling and bull riding, um, bronc riding. Um, and sometimes they actually competed directly against men. Um, then rodeo in the 1930s really starts to professionalize. We're starting to see the first um, 
formation of like rodeo organizations, kind of all of that is really beginning in the 1930s. Um, and simultaneously in the 1930s is when you have the removal of women from the rodeo. Um, and then they reemerge in the 40s with barrel racing, an event that was kind of created by women for women in that period. So you've got this really kind of convoluted um, history that emerges. And I think it's one that for many of the people who study, especially women in the rodeo, it's it's always such a surprise. I know my classes, um, my like U.S. survey classes are always so surprised when I talk about this because we often think about women, people gain rights, right? As we go forward, we gain rights. Um, but you don't think about there, there was a time when women had more rights and then they had less rights and those were taken away. And women are still trying to get back to that space that existed 100 years ago for them in the rodeo. Well, let's start going through uh, the the different uh, versions of of rodeo, the different rodeos that you that you talk about in the book. And I mean, one one of the the, the major takeaways that I found in the book, one of the goals of the book, perhaps, is deconstructing this sort of we're not even deconstructing, but moving us away, moving the reader away from this kind of mythic image of you know like the the stoic white male cowboy, because that's a pretty limited view of who has historically participated in rodeo. So let's start by talking a little bit about Chareada and Escaramuza. Could you tell us about about those those events? Yeah, and so one thing about this book is I kind of think about it like five miniature books in one book. Um, all all of these topics are topics that need um, full like multi book um, kind of studies. Um, and there are and there are full book studies of a couple of these different rodeo uh, rodeo types, but they're they're not they do not exist for all of them. Um, and part of what really drew me to this study, because I, I always felt like I was going about it a little bit backwards because I'm like, well, I really need to do like the five books first and then I can do the comparative. Um, but that would have been like a multi lifelong project that I couldn't do. And I really liked the comparative aspect um, and because I think that's where that's where I can get at that story of like rodeo is refuge, rodeo is rebellion. It, it really comes out when you see um, what's happening in each of these different rodeos. Um, and for me, it made sense to start with the Chariata. Um, so the Chariata is the, the rodeo in Mexico, um, though, of course, we have Chariata in the United States as well. Um, and it's exactly the same story as um, Western American rodeo, where you have people who were working on ranches, and, and over time, you have these informal competitions that are emerging. Um, you've got some uh, notes about this going back to like the 1500s, where they're talking about these kind of uh, roundups and competitions that are created around them. Um, and then in the 1930s, um, the chariata becomes designated as the official sport of Mexico as a way to kind of um, create, ha have help create a more unified Mexican identity after the Mexican Revolution. Um, and the, the triada is a very kind of gendered competition. Um, there are very significant limits on what women can do in the triada, which honestly is not that different than um, the professional um, rodeo circuit in the U.S. Uh, the same is true there. And so the Escatamutsa is the event that women can participate in in the triada, and it's actually um, a very new event. And um, there's some discussion about like the chari about the escaramuza as this thing that's emerging um in the early 1950s and by the 1970s um the escaramuza appeared pretty regularly in chariotas both in, in mexico and in the united states um though it was basic it was essentially like a i kind of call it like a halftime show um where the women would come out and do this incredible routine and I mean, it is filled with roping and raining. And um, if you have never seen uh, an Escatamutza um, event, I strongly recommend that you look up some YouTube videos um, because it, it, they are doing this in such close proximity to each other at such, such high speeds in these incredibly frilly dresses and hats. And they are all doing it side saddle. Um, and the Escatamutza didn't become an official competition for women until the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, so it, that's a little bit about the chariata. I don't know if you're it, if there's anything else related to that that you'd like me to expand on. Well, I was wondering maybe if you could you could relate it to this idea of of uh, refuge and rebellion. Um, I mean, I, I, I 
I, 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 I can understand how, how all of these can, can represent that. But, um, but the, the way you describe it in the book, you make the connections really well between these five kind of, in certain ways, very disparate versions of rodeo. So can you, can you maybe make that, make that connection a little bit, a little bit clearer? Yes. Thank you so much yeah. for, for the push there <laughs> in that direction. Um, I think that the chariata is, and especially the escadamutsa is a, such a great example of this because when I first started this project, I, I kept wanting to see, like, you know, my first year, like, master student, um, straight, straight out of college, like, I kept wanting to see these women who were like, no, we're not going to be limited to barrel racing anymore. Like, no, like, we want to do this, like, we will see this and, and kind of pushing against these things. Um, because you're, you're already pushing against kind of standards and expectations as a woman in rodeo. And I didn't really see that very much. Um, and that's especially true of the Escaramuza. Um, even though women are really quite limited in the Escaramuza, um, there is a reason that they participate in it. Um, the Escaramuza and the Chariata itself both have, they both try to make very clear these historical antecedents, right? Tied to like um, working vaqueros on ranches or the, uh, the kind of upper class chados who owned the ranches. Um, so for women, you have a little bit of both of those as well. Um, and then for women, especially, you've got this tie to the soldaderas, these women um, who were participating as fighters and couriers um, and riders during the Mexican Revolution. Um, and the, the dress that appears in um, the Escada Muta, there's a very there's, there are very specific um, kind of costuming requirements um, that, that the groups are judged on in addition to their kind of riding ability. Um, and those that that outfit or one of the outfit options is um, tied back to in part to the soldaderas. And so for these women participating in the escaramuza is a celebration of themselves as women, um, of what they as Hispanic women have done in Mexico and Mexican history. Um, and it's so it's not really seen as a limitation. Right. You're not seeing you're not you're not limited by that. It's a celebration of who you are. Um, and that also really, I think, helps us understand why even in the United States, when you've got kind of other rodeo options, the chariata is the events that many of these people want to participate in because it is about celebrating and maintaining this connection to Mexico. And I think you see that in a way that's so much different than you do for people who participate in the chariata within Mexico, right? If you're an immigrant or you're from this immigrant family, um, it's a way to maintain that connection even when, when you're in the U.S. So as, as a man in the chariata, you could, you could participate in an event that is the same event that exists in Western Rodeo. Not all of the events are the same, but some, some there's overlap, right? So you could choose to participate in the Western Rodeo. but that would simply be making a decision based on that event as a sport, right? And if you participated in that sport in the Western Rodeo, you would make more money. But it's not about it being a sport. It's about being this kind of, this point of cultural celebration, right? You're there with your family, for your family, for your background, and for your people, and, and, and for, for your country, and I think for those in the U.S., for your countries. As, as you said at the outset about 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 performing a certain idea of, of history and identity building right yeah 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 exactly it is it is all about that and I think in the chariata and escaramuza you can see most clearly that idea that you are performing this past you're reproducing that past but you're also inventing it right because if you look at the images and there's a great photograph of these soldaderas um, during the Mexican Revolution and then you look at the clothing, that the women in the Escaramuza are wearing today, they look nothing alike, right? We are inventing this new version of what that is um, to kind of to celebrate today, but it still has this kind of historical authenticity to it and legitimacy to it, even though it is something that's created, if that makes sense. It does, it does. Um, 
I think my favorite chapter of the book, or at least the the, the chapter that was most illuminating to me, where I, I knew there, there was something that I didn't know anything about that you I thought you you explained really well, was the story of rodeo in Hawaii. Uh, like I said, it was definitely the history that I knew the least about going into the book. Can you tell us a bit about when does ranching and rodeo and pau uh, in Hawaii when when do these these cultural forms uh, emerge, and what is the story of Hawaiian writer uh, writer engaging in rodeo as rebellion and refuge what, what's what's the story in the history there so this is the chapter that i think you are not alone here uh, i think this is one that probably most people will find the most surprising as long as you are not hawaiian um if if you are in if you are on any of the islands in hawaii um ranching is all around you uh and if you're just going to hawaii and you're going to honolulu and you're staying in waikiki you're not seeing it. And it, but as soon as you get out of Honolulu, you're seeing ranches, you're seeing signs for ranches, you're seeing rodeos, um, you're seeing this in Maui, you're seeing it in Kauai, you're seeing it obviously on the Big Island. Um, the Big Island, the center of the Big Island is still a ranch, a very large ranch. Um, so there is this very long and very deep ranching history in Hawaii. And so of course there's this long um, rodeo tradition in Hawaii as well. Um, So cattle were first introduced to Hawaii in the 1790s in the same way that cattle and pigs and other domesticated animals were introduced across islands in the Pacific um, by like British sailors and American sailors and other European sailors. Uh, They were kind of planting food there um, for them to use as they're going across these, um, these, these voyages and explorations and imperialist actions. Um, So cattle are first introduced to the islands of Hawaii in the 1790s. Um, Horses are first introduced there in the early 1800s. Um, And cattle were, I'm sorry, not cattle, um, horses were were used and ridden, but we don't really see ranching be the next step that emerges there. Um, And I think one thing that people might find enjoyable in the book, and I'm not the only one who talks about this, I do do not want to take the credit there. Um, There are these almost hilarious accounts of these just wild cattle that have been um, loose, running loose on the interior of these islands because they were sickly at first. They weren't doing well. And so the king of Hawaii put um, put a kapu on them, a rule that said you could not kill these cattle. Um, and so they, I mean, they had just gone wild and they're terrorizing people. And so in the 1830s, the king like reverses his kapu and he's like, well, we got to get these cattle under control. Um, and he hires cattle killers. So they're not ranching and raising these cattle. They're just, they're going in and gathering the wild cattle from the interior of these islands and um, taking them to the shore. They're having to swim them across um, on these boats and then swim them out to, and then hoist them to larger boats. I mean, it's this incredible process. Um, there's this quote that I came across that said, um, like, I'm more a seaman than I am a, co- than I am a cowboy right? Like to be a cowboy in Hawaii, um, you had to engage in the water and you were swimming cattle and you were, you were doing things that were so different than what we, we think of as kind of cattle work. Um, and then we have ranching that's really being introduced and beginning in Hawaii kind of in the 1840s and 1850s. Um, and then we've got from there a similar trajectory that we see with other rodeos. The first account I could find of a rodeo, that does not mean it is the first rodeo, but the first account I could find of a rodeo in Hawaii was in 1903. Um, And it sounds like it was very much like these ranch rodeos, where it was a group of uh, Paniolos, Paniolos were the the cowboys in Hawaii, um, who were getting together and kind of showing off their ranching skills. Um, Clearly, they had a lot of skills, because in 1908, several Hawaiian cowboys um, traveled to Wyoming and participated in the Cheyenne Frontier Days, where they placed uh, first, third, and sixth in steer roping, and stunned and shocked um, the American cowboys. Um, though the people in Hawaii were not surprised because they knew how good their cowboys were. Um, and from there, we just really see rodeo spreading across the Hawaiian islands. And, and they spread across the islands. And really, the, the chapter on rodeo in Hawaii is such is a very different one than the rest of these chapters, because rodeo in Hawaii is not really a separate rodeo, right? Like it's not, 
a race or a group specific rodeo. Um, the, 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 whole, the, the rodeo circuit in Hawaii is the same um, other than a few different events, but really it's the same as the, like kind of the PRCA and other types of rodeo circuits, um, Western rodeo circuits within the, the mainland United States. But it's also very separate because it's in Hawaii. Um, it is very difficult for Hawaiian riders to ever make it to the professional level because there are no PRCA rodeos in Hawaii. Um, it's difficult enough to even find enough rodeos to go to to kind of reach that sort of quality level because you are having to travel between islands to get to these rodeos. There's not like a whole circuit of rodeos that exists just on your island. If you're from Kauai, there are rodeos for you to do in Kauai, but you also have to go to Maui and to Hawaii and to Oahu to do these rodeos. Um, and this is very difficult, especially if you're um, a roper, um, if you're a barrel racer, because not only do you have to travel and pay for that ticket, you have to ship your horse there. Um, so this is, it's, it is very difficult um, for people to participate in rodeo um, in Hawaii and try to kind of reach that sort of professional level in terms of skill and, and participation. Um, before I move into pa'u riding, were there any um, any other questions about kind of ranching or rodeo in Hawaii? Well, not 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 really. Uh, I, I'm just kind of curious in general what these kind of limitations that you're talking about, how they have made uh, rodeo as it is uh, performed in Hawaii, how it makes uh, it kind of unique to to that particular place. And this will probably get us into the story of pa'u a little bit as well. Yeah. So I mean. Honestly, rodeo in Hawaii isn't unique. Like so it, this sounds horrible, right? But it, it's it, if you go to a rodeo in Kauai, it feels like a rodeo anywhere else, except that you've got these beautiful mountains behind you and palm trees, and the Hawaiian flag is very prominent, and then you've got the ocean on the other side. Like so, there's things about that where you're like, this doesn't feel like the type of place where I should be at a rodeo. Um, but otherwise, it is it is just like going to a rodeo in Arizona or in Texas or in Northern California. Um, kind of one exception to this is there's a the Po'o Wa'u, and I am, apologize in advance for anyone who speaks Hawaiian because I am sure that is an incorrect pronunciation. Um, but this is a uniquely Hawaiian event that is held in Hawaii and ties back to the time of like the cattle killers in the 1820s and 1830s. And so that's this this one time where you do get to see this different sort of event that happens there. Um, one of the other things that's quite different about rodeo in Hawaii, which it's the same about ranching in Hawaii and just about life in Hawaii in general, is um, the rodeo in Hawaii is very um, racially diverse because of course you have incredible racial diversity in Hawaii as well. Um, people of African descent and um, Caribbean and um, Portuguese and Native Hawaiians and white Americans. And you've got kind of all of this intermixing that happens there, um, which I think then this can get us into pa'u writing, because whenever we're talking about Hawaii or ranching in Hawaii or who are the Paniolos who are doing this work, um, in Hawaii, it's a very interesting and complicated and sometimes contentious conversation about who does that work, who should do that work, and what background and what history are you celebrating with that work. Um, and, I, and you can see this most clearly with the pa'u. Um, so uh, pa'u riding is a specific riding technique that is done by women in Hawaii. And it's got kind of this complicated um, background where you've got some claims that it sort of emerged as this writing style by these kind of elite um, plantation owner, ranch owning wives. Um, so who were mostly, but not always um, white, or, or at least tended to have some Euro-American kind of background. Um, and it was the kind of this, uh, this cloth that they draped themselves with as they're riding across the, the islands. And supposedly it's before the um, side saddle was introduced. So they're riding astride. Um, and they're riding across the islands to go visit their friends. Um, but you also have accounts going back to like the 1850s of native Hawaiian women who are also riding on horses and doing this kind of intricate cloth wrapping. 
Um, so you so you really have this kind of multi-part and multi-racial background um, to Pau um, that really is starting to come together in the 1870s and 1880s when um, the Pau sort of moves from this rural location, um, kind of plantation or ranching or whatever, um, and become and appears in urban and suburban areas. And you've got Pau groups that get together on Saturdays and they go out and they they ride in their Pau outfits. Um, and then you see the Pau appear in parades and you're even seeing the kind of royal family, Native Hawaiian royal family participate in Pau. And it, you, you just have all of these components that are happening there. Um, and for people who haven't seen my book and haven't seen the pictures, um, the Pau is like this 22 foot long cloth that through this very complicated process of kind of wrapping and remember you're riding astride, so you're making this sort of like pantlet thing out of it. But when you're on the horse, it looks like this beautifully draped um, kind of skirt. So it almost looks like you could be side saddle, um, except you are astride. Um, and it's traditionally held together with um, several kukui nuts. So this kind of like a walnut sort of sized nut. Um, so it's very tightly wrapped around you so that it doesn't come off. And it's just this kind of um, beautiful flowing fabric. Um, so we've got this, uh, when we, to kind of, to kind of continue into the story of like the complexities around Pau, right? We already have, it's like, well, is it from this kind of white background? Is it from this native Hawaiian background? And then it gets even more complicated in the late 1800s, early 1900s, because you've got like native Hawaiian royalty that are going out and participating in the Pau, making this claim to like, Hawaiian, native Hawaiian culture at the same time that they are being deposed from the throne and Hawaii is being taken over by the United States, right? And so what you end up having are these kind of two separate veins of parades where the Pau is happening. Um, you have these floral parades, which are kind of created as Washington's birthday parades, which were appearing all across the United States at this time. And this is the parade where you are showing that like Hawaii is American, right? Um, and you're maybe showcasing these like aspects of Native Hawaiian culture to show like, oh, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it unique? Like, look at this place, come and visit, be a tourist. But they're also happy Americans. Right. Um, and then you have the same people who are participating in Pau and they're often Native Hawaiian, though they're often of mixed racial descent, who are then also participating in the Kamehameha Day parades, which are all about a claim to Native Hawaiian culture and history. And these two things are happening simultaneously, right? So here, I think you've got this perfect example of kind of like, it's not rodeo, right? But riding as refuge and rebellion and these Kamehameha Day parades are like the encapsulation of both of those happening at once, right? Where you can be safely Native Hawaiian and you're also showing that you are Native Hawaiian and that, that you're proud of it. And this continues to be an issue within Pau today. Um, there are different people that have very different beliefs about who can participate and who should participate. Um, do you need to be Native Hawaiian? Do you need to be part Native Hawaiian? There are some people who say, yes, it is not appropriate to do Pau if you are not Native Hawaiian. Um, there are other people that say it's an important opportunity for a variety of people to participate in because it is introducing them to Hawaiian history and to that background. And it's a way to continue that story and especially continue that story of ranching. So it's kind of like an educational opportunity instead of a claim to like kind of cultural heritage. But, you, but you've got all of these different things um, that exist within Pau and the story of Pau and within the story of kind of rodeo and ranching in Hawaii as a whole. And the story of, of, of rodeo in Hawaii also, uh, I mean, as you kind of said at the outset, that your part of your goals is to decouple uh, rodeo from the American West, that obviously in, in a lot of ways it is inextricably Western, but in other ways, it's also kind of not, too. And, and the story of Rodeo in Hawaii, I think, does a good job of, of getting to that, that point as well. Well, I guess, I guess then we could have a debate on whether Hawaii is part of the American West. So, and, and I would argue that, that it is, um, based on some of this background mm -hmm. that's there. Um, but, but yeah, it's a different, it's, it's, a, it's what a lot of people have not thought of as being connected to the American right. West. Right, right, right. 
Native American rodeo is uh, uh, an especially good example, I thought, of how rodeo can serve as a, a form of rebellion against all kinds of things, including against kind of stereotyped notions of who participates in rodeo and, and who the sport of rodeo is for, right? And so what is the history of Native rodeo and how does it also serve as this, as this form of, of rebellion and refuge? Yeah, so you have a very long history of Native American um, and Native Canadian, because in this chapter, I talk a lot about um, the, rode- the the Indian rodeo circuits. And I, I do talk in the book about why I use the term Indian for this, because the INFR and IIFR both use um, Indian to talk about um, both of those form- both of those rodeo circuits that they have. Um, but there is there, this, this, these rodeo circuits exist in both Canada um, and the United States. So um, you've got this involvement in both um, Canada and the U.S. of Native peoples um, participating in ranching um, from from very early on. And sometimes there are tribes that were um, kind of voluntarily adopting ranching. And then I'm looking specifically at like the ranching of cattle here as kind of an economic opportunity and a way to kind of support themselves. But you also have um, tribes that were sort of forced into ranching as a way to survive after um, kind of buffalo were removed or as a, as a way to try to survive on the reservation. So you've got people coming to ranching in very different ways that are quite different from the avenues to ranching in the other, um, the, the other chapters that I look at, right? So there's something in that history of ranching that could be very, um, very difficult and very traumatic um, for some people. And for some groups, when we're looking at kind of native involvement in ranching, um, but it, but once you have this involvement in ranching, you again see rodeo as kind of this natural outcropping of kind of ranching and these kind of c- celebrations and competitions that come from that, and then this involvement in rodeo. Um, but you also have people, um, native peoples, that are participating in kind of like rodeo adjacent events, like Wild West shows. Um, What I think is really interesting is that some of the people who are involved in Wild West shows as Native Americans, and they are being presented like as Native Americans in kind of stereotypical Native American roles are actually rodeo participants. Um, There's a really great story um, that in the book that talks about this group of um, Native Canadians um, who they'd been invited to go over to Australia, and they all thought that they were going to go over to like just be cowboys. Um, and when they get there, Canada was like, no, 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 no. Um, we need you to be native, um, that you need to kind of put on what we want you to wear. Like you cannot wear your cowboy garb. Like that's not what's going on here. Um, we need you to play up this one side of your story when they really wanted to play up this other side. Um, and so for a lot of um, Native Canadians and Native Americans, being able to participate in rodeo was something that was um, kind of a connection to that ranching background, but also Um, like an economic opportunity, right? Like a sport and the way that it was becoming a sport for many other, um, for many white um, participants in rodeo. Um, You don't have always the same type of um, legal discrimination that existed against Native peoples in rodeo that you did um, for African Americans in rodeo, Um, but you also still had these separate rodeo circuits that were created for and by um, Native Americans, and also including the participation of Native Canadians um, in those rodeos. And and I'll ask more generally about uh, about about sort of where rodeo stands today. But but what is, where does where does native rodeo stand today? Is it how 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 popular is it, and what what sort of role does it play in in native communities around North America uh, here in the early twenty first century? Yeah, so um, these rodeo circuits are they they are big, they are popular, they are growing, they are not getting smaller, um, and they are places that. I mean, they function in much the same way that rodeos do in any community, right? It's like a part of a larger fair or a celebration, and it's like this community event. Um, And you really see that in a lot of these rodeos. Like a lot of the INFR rodeos, like these are the the, the professional rodeos on the circuit, um, but they'll be kind of across the, the Navajo Nation, for instance. And they're a lot of times connected to like the Navajo fair that takes place. Um... And you've got this 
really great blending of when they're like on the Navajo reservation, this really great blending of kind of like Navajo culture with, um, with rodeo. So what is in many ways kind of a traditional like Western rodeo, but you also have the announcer announcing in Navajo and doing, and, and you really feel the sense of community. It's the same families that are coming back again and again. Um, representatives from the same tribes that are coming from across the United States. So like this rodeo might be happening um, outside of Gallup, New Mexico, but you've got these, you've got people coming from Florida and from Montana and from um, central Canada. You've got, everyone's kind of converging in what otherwise might seem like just a small community rodeo. And it's this, this coming together of people where you've got this kind of celebration of Western identity, but also, though I know I'm including Florida in that, a kind of Western identity of rodeo with kind of native culture in a way that's like sort of similar to the powwow, but it just, it looks and feels much more like a rodeo because of course it is a rodeo. I don't, I don't know if that quite got at what you were, what you were looking yes, for. Yes, yes, it, it definitely did. Um, you also in the book talk a, a fair amount about black rodeo and I feel as though the history of black cowboys have gained a greater sort of public recognition in the sort of mythic story of the American West that, that the United States likes to tell about itself, but black rodeo perhaps somewhat less so. And I found your, your discussion of it, your the, the history that you tell here, to be a really fascinating case study in the history of rodeo more generally. So can you tell us a bit about the history of black men and women rodeo riders? Yes, and I agree with you 100% on this. There have been um, scholars since like the 1960s and 1970s who have been talking about like changing this narrative of cowboys um, on ranches, but mostly they're talking about like cowboys on like the cattle drives, right? That this was not a uniquely white experience. You have um, very large numbers of black cowboys that participated in this and of other racial groups that participated as well. But I think most of that study has been of black cowboys. And yet there has been so little study of black rodeo. I think out of all, out of these different chapters, um, black rodeo, so the chariata and then um, Native American rodeo are the most studied, by which I mean there's one to two books (laughs) that exist on them. Um, There's a lot on Hawaiian ranching. There's nothing really on Hawaiian rodeo. And there's very little on black rodeo. Um, and they're really, they're, this is a, a place that needs so much more studying because it has, as you can tell from this chapter, um, I really wanted this chapter, like I wanted all of these chapters, um, to have this kind of show this ranching background and then really show kind of the development of these separate um, kind of rodeo circuits. And in Black Rodeo, you can see that there's just so many different things going on. There's so many different circuits that are being created. You've got this background and kind of uh, an involvement in ranching and these cattle drives and in the um, kind of white western rodeo and then removal of black people from that rodeo and kind of ability to reappear in that rodeo post uh, segregation. It's just it's a place that's ripe for so much stuff. Um, Demetrius Pearson has a few um, articles that look at some of these uh, black rodeo circuits in Texas and the south. Um, Rebecca Schofield in her book, um, she's got also got a chapter on black rodeo and look specifically at uh, the Black Rodeo in Bowley, Oklahoma, and then also at um, a parade in Oakland, California. Um, And I I think that mine really pairs nicely with what both of them do, which are kind of highlighting these more specific like spotlights. And I try to tell kind of the broader story so you can get kind of a sense of that development. Um, Do you want any background on kind of like African-American involvement in ranching, or do you think you're more interested, do you think people would be more interested in hearing more about like kind of that rodeo? Uh, personally, I, I was interested in both in the book. So by all means, talk talk about both kind of the the, the, the deeper background and the, the, the more kind of contemporary rodeo aspect as well. Okay. Uh, so in the book, I talked, I mean, a little bit about the the involvement of kind of like black cowboys on the cattle drives, but that that, that is something that certainly people have discussed before. Um, And so what I was really trying to find were these stories about black ranchers. So it could be black cowboys working on um, ranches, maybe they were white owned ranches, but also um, black ranch owners and working black cowboys. And there was a surprising amount of information 
that is available out there. And I think this, this, our ability to learn this is only going to grow because, I mean, I was only able to, to do this and the way that I could because of the incredible digitization efforts that, hap that, is, that has happened um, with newspapers. Um, so through the Library of Congress, um, through newspapers.com, through I found a ton of really great information from across the 20th century in um, the Texas Digital Newspaper Project. So just as a note for anyone interested in doing research, um, don't just rely on your newspapers.com account, though it is amazing. Um, you will find different things in the Library of Congress digitized newspapers, and you will find often different things in the digitized newspaper collections that every state has. Um, so just look at look at all of those places. So I was kind of finding these little snippets um, of kind of these black ranchers and black cowboys. And as I was doing that, there were always these instances of of race, right? Like sometimes we think about and talk about the American West as a place that um, black people were coming from the South and they were able to kind of get land and they'd be able to be cowboys and you have this like greater freedom and less discrimination. And in some ways that is true. But at the same time, um, anytime there was some sort of confrontation or thing that was happening, um, black cowboys were not existing as cowboys. Um, white cowboys were cowboys. Black cowboys were black cowboys. Um, and they were identified as different and often problematic and often the ones causing whatever the problem was. Um, so you see, even within that realm of like ranching and cowboy work, um, while they could do that work, they were often separated out and identified as someone different. Um, and then you see exactly the same thing in rodeo. So you've got the participation of black cowboys in rodeo by the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, sometimes they were able to participate in some of these like large national rodeos or the smaller amateur rodeo circuits. Um, and, but they were often always identified as someone who was separate, like the dusky demon, right? Um, here's this different sort of person to identify and wow, look at what he can do. Um, he's not really quite human. Um, and, and then sometimes black writers were having to present themselves as Mexican or Spanish or as Native American as a way to get around segregation laws in rodeos. So you could either be maybe like well known enough as Bill Pickett that like you could be the exception to the segregation rules um, or you could present yourself as one of these other races to try to get into those rodeos. Um, and so for that reason, you are seeing the development of separate black rodeos. I mean, this is the most, this is the development that is the most, this is the development of these separate rodeos that is the most specifically and explicitly tied to discri racial discrimination and to legal segregation, right? Um, you also have black rodeos that are emerging as black rodeos, not necessarily because they are created to be black rodeos, but because they are being created within segregated communities, right? So like in Bryan, Texas, it was very segregated and you had kind of the white rodeo in that part of town and the black rodeo in this part of town or the black rodeo that was in the town over. Um, so some of, these, some of these black rodeos were black rodeos specifically um, designed to be that way and some of them were kind of like de facto that way, right? Because of the segregation that already existed in society and where people were living. Um, and that can sometimes still be the case even today um, with, with rodeos in the U.S. I mean, we, we have rodeos that are, I mean, they're not required to be white, but most of our rodeos are white rodeos. Um, and I, I talk in the book about how, you know, I'll say like Western rodeo or mainstream rodeo or straight rodeo or white rodeo. There's no rule that says they have to be straight or you have to be white, but they are. They are straight and they are white um, because of the communities in, in which they exist. Um, and then eventually um, you see the creation not just of like individual um, black rodeos, like kind of like amateur community rodeos. Um, you also see the creation of um, black rodeo circuits. Um, and a lot of these are emerging more in like the 1970s, 80s, 90s. Um, so you've got like the Real Cowboys Association. You've got the Cowboys of Color circuit. Um, these are kind of at like the sort of like amateur level, but like semi, like amateur slash semi-professional sort of level where it's people who are participating in these rodeos as um, for kind of 
community and group identity and celebration, like you have with Native American rodeo or like you have with the chariata, but you also have people who are participating in these rodeos as they would in kind of any sort of like semi-professional rodeo circuit where they are trying to get to the professional level. Um, so I think you see it almost more in black rodeo than any of these other circuits, um, though you see it in Native American rodeo too, that um, you'll participate in like Native American rodeo or black rodeo with the goal of also participating on the professional circuit. So it's not like instead of the professional, like you're doing this instead of the professional circuit, or once you reach the professional circuit, you're going to stop doing like Cowboys of Color, or you're going to stop doing the INFR. Um, you often people are wanting to still do both of those. One, it's like the professional circuit is like the sport, right? Like here's the sport and the recognition and the money and kind of that professional like athlete goal. But in terms of like community and identity and the reason that got you into rodeo in the first place and the thing that like feeds your soul is the native rodeo circuit or it is the black rodeo circuit. Um, and I think that that's a really, a really great example to show where you've got kind of these multiple motivations um, for a lot of these like non-white, non-straight um, contestants. And finally, in the book, you also discuss uh, gay rodeo. And could you uh, tell us a bit about how gay rodeo emerges as a space of refuge and rebellion? Uh, maybe the history of the IR, uh, IGRA a bit. And also, in the book, you also dis kind of describe how, you know, the, the idea of gay ro rodeo, or maybe the phrase gay rodeo, actually kind of papers over some schisms within that, 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 uh, that version of rodeo as well. Could you talk about, a bit about that, too? Yeah. So um, gay rodeo starts kind of the first interest is not so much in rodeo, but like this um, enthusiasm in like cowboy culture um, within gay urban um, male communities and in like New York, but like more so in like um, San Francisco and Los Angeles. And so the first kind of cowboy group, cowboy rodeo group that I could find um, was the Golden State Cowboys, which formed in the late six, 1960s and existed through the mid-1970s. And they were um, a group of gay men who were rodeo enthusiasts, though they didn't really want to participate, um, at, least, at least in anything I could find in the minutes. They were rodeo enthusiasts, and they um, were wanting to come to their meetings in like full cowboy paraphernalia, like this is a rule written into their constitution. Um, and then they were going to go to rodeos together. So it really was this idea of an enthusiast group. But it gets kind of interesting because they also held their own like rodeo type competitions, um, but I wasn't able to find that much about like what that entailed or who these people were or what their background was and like where they were coming from or if they any of them ever made that transition into like the Reno Rodeo and IGRA when kind of gay rodeo gets like more formalized as like an event. Um, so that group folds in kind of ironically the same year that the first gay rodeo is held. Um, so the Reno um, Rodeo, is uh, the first gay rodeo is getting organized in 1975 and held in 1976. Um, and it really comes out of some of the, like the gay um, kind of pageant circuit. And it was intended to be a, it really is it's complicated because it was intended to be this fundraiser um, related to someone who was participating in the pageant circuit. Um, and, and Gay Rodeo has always had this focus on community fundraising. But at the same time, it was created as a space for gay men, though it always was inclusive of women. Women could always, from the beginning, participate in all of the events. But it very clearly was created for gay men as a place for them to engage in rodeo as kind of expressions of like heteronormative masculinity. Um, so you could be gay and do rodeo, but it was also about showing that you could be a masculine kind of traditional gay um, man um, by kind of adopting this like cowboy persona. OK, um, so it's kind of got this like really complicated sort of thing that's happening. Um, there started to be like state organizations like a Colorado group and a Texas group that were also that started to be formed in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And there was kind of this contentious relationship between like the Reno Rodeo and like these other state organizations. And eventually 
and they kind of come together like the Reno Rodeo sort of folds and these other state organizations are kind of taking over um, and they form the IGRA, the International Gay Rodeo Association in the mid 1980s. Um, and that is the organization that continues to be the organizing body for gay rodeo in the United States and in Canada. Um, and they start holding like a finals rodeo and, and really there's like this explosion of gay rodeo in the 1980s um, through the 1990s, early 2000s. Um, you said, I think you were from New York. Well, don't you worry, there was like a, there's a gay rodeo circuit in New York, um, Pony. Um, so you've got like, uh, if there wasn't enough kind of rodeo enthusiasts, rodeo riders in one state, then they kind of merge with several states. And you'd have kind of, there were just rodeo circuits that were popping up everywhere. There were like multiple of these rodeo organizations um, that were formed in like Texas and in Oklahoma. They're dividing. You've got so many of them. Um, and and then you kind of have a, a it, it sort of implodes. <laughs> like there's it's just there's so many, it becomes almost too many. And it starts to pull back a bit um, because I think for a while there was like this enthusiasm um, of kind of gay communities across the country to participate um, in this thing. But for so many of them, there wasn't like that historical connection. If you're from Delaware, if you're from New York, like rodeo was like this fun kind of thing to do, but like to be good at rodeo, it takes a commitment. It takes a lot of time. And it was, it, it was difficult, I think, for people who don't have that same sort of like regional or geographical or historical connection to it. Um, to kind of continue with that because like you're not making like money from gay rodeo like this is a thing you do for love um, but I think what's kind of amazing about gay rodeo is that there's so much that they have done that has they've, they've tried to do to be inclusive right including women in all of the events from the beginning um, they're much more open to trans um, participants they have like drag competitions they've got camp events um, they also are open to straight riders and they actually will hold um, before they have the rodeo, like the day or two before, they will often host um, like a workshop so that if you are from because the rodeos are held in urban communities. Right. So like if you're gay in Kansas City or if you're like gay in um, Los Angeles, like you're probably not from a ranching background and you may not like actually know how to ride a horse. But like you want to come do this like thing that is within the gay community. Right. And so they'll host these workshops that allow people to learn how to do the different events. And then the next day you come to the rodeo and you can participate. So like they know that a lot of the participants don't have that background. So they're trying to help them get involved. Um, and they also have all of their different categories of like their kind of uh, strands of competition. Um, in each one of those categories, there is at least one event that's sort of like the entry level event that you can do if you do not own a horse, if you cannot ride a horse, if you do not how to rope. So like any of those skills that like you think you need like to participate in any rodeo, much less excel at the rodeo, um, they actually have these other options within the gay rodeo. Um, that being said, there are certainly some kind of points of contention within the gay rodeo. Um, how open is it really to women? Um, the rate of female participation in the rodeo is no higher today than it was in the first rodeos in the 1970s and that's about like 20 percent of the participants um how open is it really to trans participants and um, how welcoming is the rodeo really to the drag queens that raise millions of dollars and um, so you've got a, a lot of different things that are happening within the gay rodeo so zooming out a little bit as as we as we start to, to to wrap up our conversation about about this book, where does professional rodeo in particular stand today in terms of inclusivity? You've kind of gestured toward this a little bit so far in our conversation, but is traditional quote unquote I, I want to emphasize that here uh, very much like the, the sort of mainstream vision of what rodeo is is it changing at all to include women to include people of color to include people generally who are who have been traditionally excluded from kind of the, the top tier the 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 most the highest paying rodeo competitions is indeed is inclusion in such events even the major goal of a lot of the varieties of rodeo that we've discussed here today so in a nutshell no is the answer <laughs> to both of those questions yeah. um so no uh like kind of western rodeo is not 
kind of becoming increasingly diverse. I mean, in, in, in bits, right? In like fits and bits it is. So you are at times seeing um, like more black competitors. Um, you do have black writers that increasingly um, identify less outright racism that they're facing from other writers and from the communities where these rodeos take place. Because up through the 1980s and 1990s, black writers talk a lot about incredible racism that they faced from other cowboys um, participants and from communities. So some of that I think is changing and is lessening to an extent, um, but it doesn't mean that then you're seeing kind of this explosion. Like every now and then you'll see um, like an, an Asian American participant in, in kind of the professional circuit. Um, you see a, a large number of like Brazilian and kind of Latin American participants in like bull riding, but it's I wouldn't say it's anything that's really changed or grown over the last 20 years. Um, that's remained pretty similar. Um, the position of women in rodeo, especially at the professional level, is all still the same. Um, as a woman, you cannot be a member of the PRCA. Um, you have to be a member of a separate women's group, the WPRA, and it is that group that hosts the barrel racing events. So, I mean, you are, it might look, if you go to a rodeo, that women are in the same position as, like, men, meaning, like, oh, like, yes, you can do that event, but, like, and that's, you aren't doing the other events, but, like, you're there, right? Well, no, a different organization is hosting your event and you cannot be a part, you cannot be a member of this other event. So you still have some, quite a few divisions that are there. Um, and I really like your last question, like is inclusion in such events even the major goal of many of these varieties of rodeo? And I would say, no, um, the re there is a reason that these rodeos still exist. If the goal that all of these groups had was to be included in Western rodeo, they could be included in Western rodeo, right? Like even when you're still facing some kind of discrimination in different ways, whether that's kind of um, racism or sexism or homophobia, um, there, there, there could be more of that inclusion today. But there is a reason that these other rodeo circuits exist. There is a value that they have for the groups that have created them and for the groups that have participated in them. As I said, right, a lot of the people in the chariata don't want to participate in the Western rodeo because that is not their rodeo. Um, and so that's that's really what you see. I mean, you've got people in gay rodeo who participate in kind of other amateur rodeos or other Western rodeos or the professional circuit, um, but the gay rodeo brings them something different in the same way that I talked about that with like Native Americans in rodeo or um, the uh, or the black rodeo circuit, right? Like you might have profess people on the professional circuit that are still going to do those other events because it brings them something different. Thinking about this book as a whole, uh, I mean, at, at the outset of our conversation, we talked a little bit about how, you know, you were, you were hoping to write something that was accessible to, 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 to non-specialists, um, you, you know, non-specialists in, 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 you know, history or non-specialists in rodeo uh, specifically. But so thinking about that, what takeaways do you hope people have when they come away from the book? Are there any overall kind of uh, large takeaways that you hope people get? I hope people see rodeo as a sport, but I also keep see, hope that people see rodeo as more than a sport. Like rodeo, rodeo is more than a sport because it has these historical connections and these historical ties, which allows people to use rodeo and to interact with rodeo in a way that is so fundamentally different than, like, I mean, I would argue any other kind of sport that we really have in the United States. Um, that there, there's this value that's there and there's something really rich and important about these other rodeo circuits. Like on the surface, many of them may look and feel just like another rodeo or just like a white rodeo or an amateur rodeo, but there is something that is different there in the value that they have. And I really hope that that's something that comes through in the, the book. Um, I hope this is kind of a celebration of what those other rodeos are and what they do um, and what the people who are participating in them are, are trying to do in the statements that they are trying to make about themselves and their history and their value and who they are and where they belong and how they belong. Speaking only for myself, that was definitely a takeaway that I came away with, with from, from the book having. So if that was one of your goals, then I would say it was a success. 
Um, I know this book has not been out for very long, but, uh, you know, historians tend to have a few projects going at any given time. So I'm curious if we could get a preview of uh, something that you are working on uh, next. Are there any projects you'd like to promote that you're currently uh, underway with? There is. So for years, I have wanted my next book project um, to focus on gay rodeo. Um, and when Rebecca Schofield had her book come out and she had her chapter on gay rodeo, um, and we both, there's some overlap in our chapters, but we also look at things, I think, quite differently within those chapters. Um, I contacted her to see if that was a project she was interested in pursuing herself, um, or if it was a, a project that we could potentially work on together. And so, um, we have decided that, uh, we are going to co-author a book on um, gay rodeo, which I think, first of all, is really great because historians, like, I don't know why we don't like to co-author things. We sit in our own silos and we want the project to just be ours. Um, and so I think it's really fantastic that we're going to co-author this book. And, and we really hope that that kind of becomes a model for a little bit more historical work. It's also been great because um, when you have a deadline and you've got your Google Doc, then it pushes you, to, like, it's made both of us go in and do more work than we probably would otherwise. So um, she's at the University of Idaho, um, and her book Outriders came out in 2019, and it's also fantastic. So by both of ours. Um, but so, yeah, we're going to look more specifically at the gay rodeo circuit. And just to tell you a little bit about like what that's going to look like, um, we're really looking at this as like participants in gay rodeo um, have created and kind of purposely created a different queer subculture, sexual subculture that like straddles this like urban and the rural, right? The rural is the rodeo and the urban is where we often are thinking about these like queer sexual subcultures. Um, and it's also the site um, where there's been tensions between offering this inclusive environment, right? Men and women can participate, trans and cis competitors, like all of these things. Um, but as I already said on, on today, um, it's also one that was still created by gay men for gay men. And so we're really like looking at a lot of those tensions that exist within gay rodeo. And so we're going to have um, chapters that examine like the hypermasculinity within gay rodeo, um, sex and AIDS in gay rodeo, um, rodeo drag queens and the camp events, um, the role of political and consumer power of the rodeo, um, like they did boycotts of different beer companies and airline companies, um, all kinds of things, and, um, and the position of women, both straight women and lesbians um, within the setting. So we're both I'm really excited about that project. And I was actually uh, lucky enough to host Rebecca Schofield on this very podcast uh, several months ago. So uh, when when you, you both finally released that book, I'll be thrilled to have both you back on the show again. Looking forward to it. Yes, that'll be Dr. Alyssa Ford is an associate professor of history at Northwest Missouri State University. Her new book is Rodeo as Refuge, Rodeo as Rebellion, Gender, Race, and Identity in the American Rodeo, which came out with the University Press of Kansas last year in 2020. Thank you uh, again so much for talking with me today, Alyssa. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I, I hope you enjoyed learning about the book and, and maybe go out and purchase it.